Over the past 70 years or so, Australia has recorded a steady increase in mean yearly temperatures linked to the atmospheric emissions of thermally potent greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. And Australia hasn't just been getting hotter but drier too, due largely to the warming of waters off the east coast of Africa and comparatively cooler waters west of Australia, termed a positive Indian Ocean dipole. And positive IODs are becoming stronger and more common with climate change, reducing evaporation and precipitation over Australia. The results of this can be seen here, where data on temperature and rainfall since the early 1900s shows that since the 90s, Australia has experienced an increased number of years with both extreme heat and extreme drought. So it was unsurprising when the 2019-20 bushfires set national and international records for total area burned highlighting how preparation for future fire events is becoming more and more important to land managers. So in the context of our business, and covered over the next 10 minutes, we'll be discussing some of the key questions regarding wildfire and land management, emphasising the processes and effects of fire, our response to these effects, and current or planned wildfire research. At the end of 2019, New South Wales was undergoing a multi-year drought, leaving Burragurang Lake, which supplies Warragamba Dam and up to 80% of Sydney's drinking water, at 43%, or 860,000 megalitres, having accumulated only 1% of total storage volume that year. And because of this, the catchment surrounding Burragurang Lake had high tonnage of dead and dry plant material, or fuel, considerably increasing the chance of both extensive and high-severity wildfires should ignition occur. And for these reasons, a tripartite simulation between Water New South Wales, Sydney Water and New South Wales Health was established in late 2019. With the main objectives to test the Joint Working Group's response to a severe wildfire event while identifying key processes, test contingency plans and increase training in the area. This scenario exercise was named Deep Purple. Specifically, Deep Purple was focused on the potential for wildfire to impose hazards to Warragamba Dam's water quality. Because when fire consumes a vegetated ecosystem, it reduces and transforms natural materials into their base chemical constituents through thermal decomposition. The resulting soil and ash materials are loaded with nutrients, metals and organics. And they're highly erodible due to the lack of vegetative ground cover and fire-induced changes to soil properties. So when rainfall does occur, large amounts of this soil and ash material is transported into local river networks as sediment slugs or sediment plumes, reducing light availability for photosynthesis and resulting in oxygen depletion and fish kills. The excess nutrients also facilitate greater algal production that can lead to blooms and all up, these changes reduce water quality and require a greater level of treatment effort. In late 2019, early 2020, these hazards became a reality when record wildfire and rainfall events occurred in rapid succession within New South Wales. First, up to 30% or 3,200 kilometres squared of Lake Burragurang catchment burned, destroying online inflow monitoring equipment and limiting the access of personnel to the area. Second, and within days of local fires being declared contained, the most intense rainfall in 30 years brought Warragamba Dam storage to 1,671,000 megalitres, doubling pre-rainfall storage levels. But with the learnings of Deep Purple recently cemented, Water New South Wales responded immediately to the water quality risks posed by these events, working through a process of prioritised monitoring and mitigation. During and after the fires from mid-December through to late April, a network of floating sediment booms were installed across the Burragurang catchment. The booms are aimed at slowing and partly stopping the movement of highly turbid waters towards the dam wall and the water offtake. In addition, within 48 hours of the Rural Fire Service clearing access to the lake, all communications to high resolution sampling stations were reinstated. This allows for comprehensive monitoring of the movements of fire related materials, seen here where a vertical profile system tracks both temperature and turbidity incorporating the magnitude of the variable, its depth, distribution, and its timeline. 
These data were then used to guide an extensive post-fire sampling plan that covered both high priority areas and analytes. Lastly, erosion risk modelling was carried out both in-house and in collaboration with DPIE and Swansea University, providing estimates of sub-catchment level erosion across the entire region. So we understand how fire affects water quality and we've summarised some of the main management actions taken by Water New South Wales in response to these events. But with forecasts of increased hot and dry summers, addressing our knowledge gaps on the current and ongoing effects of fire on water quality will help to prepare our business for the future. And this is where the scientific research really kicks in. So what are some of these gaps and how are we addressing them? Well, funnily enough, it all starts with a nuclear explosion. Because between the 1950s to 1970s, atmospheric nuclear weapons testing occurred worldwide. Here, indicated by the local number of nuclear tests, followed by the megatons of TNT equivalents detonated. These tests resulted in a distribution of radionucleides like cesium-137 that settled on surface soils around the globe, predominantly diffusing to only a depth of 10 centimetres. And by combining these radionuclide decay times, along with their concentrations, we can fingerprint or track the progress of fire materials from the upper catchment regions all the way to the Warragamba offtake. In May 2020, the Water Quality Programs team took roughly 80 benthic sediment cores throughout Lake Burragrang, analysing their concentrations of nutrients, metals and radionuclides. An example of these results are shown here where increased manganese and nitrogen can be seen in both the uppermost region of the catchment and at the junction of the Wollandili and Cox's arms, two sites that also had the highest contribution of burnt materials. The interpretation of this data is still underway, though initial assessment would indicate that in addition to the settled fire materials that remain in the upper river networks, when February event sediment plume lost momentum at the junction, as seen through vertical profile sampling systems shown previously, a portion of the plume settled out before reaching the water offtake. And while Water New South Wales safely managed the sediment plume related hazards at the time of the fires, quantifying its chemical composition and distribution aids our catchment managers in the assessment and mitigation of future fire related risks. So in addition to this work, a range of research projects are currently being planned to focus more heavily on the future fire scenarios and preemptive management plans, with the installation of hillside sediment erosion traps having already begun. Since mid-2020, Warding South Wales scientists have been using the humble tomato picket to help understand post-fire catchment erosion processes. You see, when thermal decomposition of vegetation occurs, it doesn't occur the same way everywhere. High temperature fires decompose more natural material than lower temperature fires, changing the chemical composition of ash and therefore the associated hazards to water quality. Similarly, soil properties, vegetation types, vegetation recovery rate all affect the fire materials that end up in our catchments. So following a cost-effective and easily replicable design, we have begun installing sediment erosion traps in areas of low and moderate severity burns, with plans to further include unburned hill slope controls, prescribed burn treatments and erosion mitigation treatments, such as mesh logs. Through these projects, we'll be able to incorporate the region-specific environmental conditions and fire severities at high resolutions providing data that will improve the outputs of our predictive erosion tools and increase the accuracy of fire-related risk assessments, preemptive of future fires. If you have any burning questions on these works and more, head over to waternewsouthwales.com.au and thanks for joining us for 10 Minutes of Fire.